It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is to the Premier. Speaker, this morning our party and our leader, Patrick Brown, laid out our concerns with the Hydro One fire sale, a sale that the PCs knew was wrong in 2002, and we know it is wrong today. This morning you heard Patrick Brown talk about the first demonstration of Hydro in 1910. The demonstration lit up a sign for all to see above a street in Kitchener, and that sign said, For the People. Speaker, because of this government's mismanagement and its desire to sell Hydro One to pay its debts, the utility will no longer be for the people. Premier, will you stop the Hydro One fire sale and keep the majority of it for the people? Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just uh, let me just say to the member opposite, and he can deliver the message to his uh, leader that um, the reason we are in the process of reviewing assets, Mr. Speaker, the reason we have made a decision about Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, is that we know that investing in transit and transportation infrastructure is critical to the economic life of this province, Mr. Speaker, and the opportunity to grow. I know that the uh, that the uh, interim leader of the opposition is not. Uh, is not supportive in, of investing in transit, Mr. Speaker. They've made that uh, very, very clear. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that we ran on a platform of economic growth and investment in this province, in people's talent and skills, in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. And the infrastructure component, Mr. Speaker, Answer. is backed up by a review of assets. That's the investment that we committed to, and that's the investment we're making, Mr. Speaker. Back to the uh, Premier. Speaker, the uh, misguided actions of the government means that Hydro One will no longer be for the people. Sadly, the sale isn't about the people. The sale isn't about infrastructure. There's nothing new in the government's recent budget about infrastructure that wasn't already laid out in last year's budget, Order. and it didn't include the sale of Hydro One at that time. The sale is about paying the government's debts, yep, their debts they can't keep under control. The Premier and the Liberal Party are not looking out for the people's interests. Premier, if you were looking out for the people of Ontario, you'd allow the auditor and the financial Account accountability officer to reveal, review the sale to make sure that we're getting the best value for the people. Will you at least commit to that today? Well, Mr. Speaker, let me, let me just remind the member opposite. As I have said many times in this House, the, uh, our plan to invest in infrastructure, whether it's roads, bridges, whether it's connecting links in uh, communities around the province, or whether it's transit infrastructure, that plan always contained as part uh, a review of our assets, Mr. Speaker, because we knew we were going to need that funding to be able to make those investments. Mr. Speaker, I will also remind the member opposite that as a, as a backdrop to our decision around Hydro One, we used the sale of the 407, Mr. Speaker, as an example of how not to sell off an asset, Mr. Speaker, because the way the 407 was sold off, there was no ongoing return to the people of Ontario. There was no targeted investment in the future of the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, there was no uh, accurate yes, assessment of the value of that asset before it was sold off. We are not doing what the opposite party did on the 407, Mr. Speaker. We're Thank investing you. in the people of Ontario. Be seated, please. Be seated. Thank you. Well, Premier, how do we know that anything you just said is true? We don't. Well, we There'll don't. be no accountability after the budget is passed this Wednesday. You're selling Hydro One to a shell company that won't be subject to oversight from the Auditor General, Freedom of Information, Financial Accountability Officer, none of the officers of this House, the Ombudsman. Your uh, telling us to believe that the $15 billion total value is the true value of Hydro One, yet there's no independent studies, there's no cost-benefit analysis, there's nobody but you and your hired hack that tells us that we're to take your word for it. You've already spent the $4 billion you're going to get in terms of $2 billion for smart meters. 1.1 to cancel gas. Question. 83 million 
we just learned in terms of the Hydro One billing scandal. Premier, why should we believe Thank anything you, you say? Yeah, we shouldn't. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, if you look around this province, you can see infrastructure projects being built around the province. Mr. Speaker, you can see shovels in the ground, and you can see projects being completed. So that, Mr. Speaker, is the experience that we are building on in our investments going forward. But I would say to the, I'd say to the member opposite, I don't know where this party is coming from, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the official opposition seems to be uh, a little confused about where he stands. Patrick Brown, on May 5th of this year, said, "I generally believe that the private sector." can do a better job than the public sector. I generally think market conditions would be a helpful for a lot of government agencies. That was Patrick Brown, May 5th, Mr. Speaker. In their, in their most recent um, paper on energy, that uh, was in 2012, Mr. Speaker, they said they suggested opening both Hydro One and OPG to investment, Mr. Speaker. So what I would say Answer. to the member opposite, they don't support investing in transit and transportation infrastructure. We understand that. We do. We know that's necessary. We said all along that we needed to review assets. That's what we're doing. Thank you. No question. The member from Nipissing, Pembroke. My question is to the Premier as well. Generally, does not mean the sale of Hydro One. <laughs> Premier, this morning we outlined three key points that worry our caucus about the Liberals' fire sale of Hydro One. First, the secrecy that is associated with this sale. The decision to sell Hydro One was made without public input. And now, with the government's recent budget amendment, we found, find that it will be done in complete secrecy. No information for the public on who is making offers to purchase it. No information on the price that is being offered. And no information on the conditions attached to the purchase. Premier, why won't you come clean with your true motives behind this fire sale? Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we've said consistently the true motive is to reposition assets that we have to invest in infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, there are tremendous infrastructure deficits across the province and across Canada, Mr. Speaker, and it's important that we invest in those. The proceeds from this sale, significant amount of them, Mr. Speaker, will go in to build infrastructure. Without raising taxes, Mr. Speaker, Remember from Stormont, without raising more debt, Mr. Speaker, and without cutting programs, Mr. Speaker. It's the right thing to do, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're proceeding with it. We said in our budget 2014, the we are going to our assets. We identified the energy agencies as well as others, Mr. Speaker. We're going ahead with our agenda, Mr. Speaker. We're making a difference for people in this province. We're creating economic development and we're creating quality of life yes, with our investments in infrastructure. Thank you. Supplementary. In February 2013, you said it was the wrong idea. It's no wonder nobody believes a word they hear from that. Yeah. Secondly, the sale of Hydro One is a bad policy decision. Whether the government owns of economic development. or 14 per cent, the fact remains the same. It is not a majority stake, and they will no longer have control. Yep. The majority will do what is in the best interest of their bottom line, not the best interest of Ontarians. Hydro One is a natural monopoly. There is no alternative. People don't have to have a choice if they don't like their service. The people will pay what the majority owners demand. Premier, why won't you stop the fire sale and make sure this natural monopoly, this hard, the sale of this natural monopoly does not harm Ontarians? Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've taken tremendous care to protect the interests of the ratepayer and the taxpayer, Mr. Speaker. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek and the member from the PN Carleton come to order. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, there are allegations that are made without basis. The structure going forward, Mr. Speaker, is to ensure that no other shareholder will have more than 10 percent interest uh, in Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. We put protections in in terms of the board of directors, uh, in terms of protecting the appointment of the directors, and requiring two-thirds vote, Mr. Speaker, which will include the Remember provincial Bruce government in all significant major decisions, Sir. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, they will choose to ignore almost everything that's in the legislation, and they will spin, Mr. Speaker, 
uh, items that have no relevance at all with respect to the way we are proceeding. Mr. Speaker, they have a policy that would privatize OPG and Hydro One. They have a new leader who wants to privatize government agencies. The member Mr. Speaker. From they can't have it both ways, Mr. Thank Speaker. Oh, yes, and final supplementary. The minister has had more positions on the sale of Hydro One than there are police investigations going into that party. The third, and our caucus has brought this up time and time again, the problems created with the lack of independent oversight are frightening. Public oversight of Hydro One ends this week, not when a majority is sold, in fact, before a single share is sold. As the budget is written, all public oversight the day it disappears the day the budget receives royal assent. Clearly, that is wrong. Sneaky. No more investigations into the billing complaints. No more information into your smart meter boondoggle. The details of the sale are being hidden, and so will all the problems that come with Hydro One. Yeah. Premier, don't you agree the public has a right to know what's going on with Question. the sale of Hydro One? I'll ask you once again, will you not remove this bad sale and any reference Thank to you. it from your budget bill? Thank you. Minister. It's interesting to note in their version of privatization, they said quite clearly the ratepayer will be protected by the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker. Rate will be protected, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, moving forward, we have protections for the ratepayer, and, and furthermore, Mr. Speaker, they know, they know very, very well that moving forward, there will be an opportunity for Hydro One to expand business, to be a growth business, at the same time as they're protecting ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. We will always have 40% interest, Mr. Speaker. We have, we have Danny Dozatel, we have Danny Dozatel, the former Auditor General, Mr. Speaker, who has indicated. Finish, please. Mr. Denny Dozotel, the former Auditor General of Canada, is overseeing the implementation of an ombudsman in the Hydro One Corporation, Mr. Speaker. Yes, sir. They also know, particularly some on the front benches, the Ontario Securities Act and the Ontario Securities Commission have tremendous protections for all Thank public you. companies, publicly traded companies. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Hydro One isn't the Premier's to sell because it belongs to Ontarians. I believe that Ontarians deserve a say, Speaker. Will this Premier agree to hold a referendum so that Ontarians can have their say on their Hydro One? Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm happy to answer this question again. I've answered this question many times in this House, Mr. Speaker. We were very clear in our budget, in our platform, in our budget again, Mr. Speaker, that in order to make the investments in transit and transportation infrastructure around the province, we needed to look at the assets that were currently owned by the people of Ontario. We need to leverage those, Mr. Speaker, in order to be able to make investments in new assets that will work for people over the coming generations, Mr. Speaker. So that is what we have done. We asked Ed Clark and his commission to look, his group to look at the assets, Mr. Speaker. We made it very clear the assets Assets that we were looking at. The decisions have been made, Mr. Speaker, that we need to make those investments in transit and transportation infrastructure. And part of the way we need to do that is to recycle the value of current assets That's into her. new assets. That's what the investments are about, Mr. Speaker. This is not her decision to make. Ontarians deserve a say on this Premier's wrong-headed decision to sell Hydro One. The Toronto Star says, and I quote, rushing this risky deal into law is wrong. The Toronto, Sa Tr Toronto Sun says, and I quote, this proposed sale of Hydro One doesn't make sense. And the Please finish. And the Globe and Mail says the scheme is based on, quote, wishful thinking accounting. The most important question is what Ontarians want for their Hydro One. So, Speaker, I ask again, will this Premier give Ontarians a say and hold a referendum on the sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you. Yep, spend one minute. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, uh, 
um, there are various decisions that uh, that are made by government that some members of the media, members of the opposition, either agree with or don't agree with, Mr. Speaker, and that actually cannot be the deciding factor in a decision that is made by a government, whether a particular media outlet or a particular member of the opposition chooses to take a different position. What we have to do as government, Mr. Speaker, is we have to, we have to take a position, which we did, Mr. Speaker, in our platform and in our budget. We have to explain the that position, Hamilton and then we have to move Creek, forward. So, Mr. Time. Speaker, in our budget, uh, we said a number of times, uh, one quote, Mr. Speaker, we will look at maximizing and un locking value from assets it currently holds the government will including real estate holdings as well as crown corporations such as OPG Hydro One and the LCBO unquote on page 164 in our 2014 budget we said and I quote valuable assets include large and Answer. complex government business enterprises such as the LCBO Hydro One and the OPG the government will launch an in-depth review process it was quite clear we were looking Thank at you. these assets Mr Speaker to Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, my opinion or some other opposition member's opinion, it's about the opinion of Ontarians which this Premier should get before she sells off Hydro One. <laughs> Speaker, on top, of, on top of not making sense, being risky, and being based on wishful thinking, the Premier's plan to sell off Hydro One is being called a con job of astronomical proportions. Yeah. Astronomical magnitude by a man who actually knows about financial sector uh, cons firsthand. Speaker, he says it's a con job because it's such a great deal for banks and investors, and such a bad deal, such a bad deal for the people of Ontario. Now, will this premier give Ontarians a say and agree to hold a referendum on Hydro One because Question. it's their right to decide whether to sell it, not her? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, Senator. what I would just say to the leader of the third party is she just cannot have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. She can't rewrite history. She can't say, on the one hand, that we didn't talk about what we were going to do, and, and in the face of all of the, the material that we put forward, Mr. Speaker, including her own statement. So on July 9, 2014, the leader of the NDP said, and I quote, the budget says in black and white that the government is looking at the sale of assets, including Crown corporations such as, on, such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we said we were reviewing assets. We said we were looking at leveraging those assets in order to invest in new assets, Mr. Speaker. That is what we are doing, and we are putting protections in place so that the regulatory controls, Answer. the price controls, will remain in place with the new company, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Sorry, my next question is to the Premier Speaker, which is exactly why New Democrats voted again that against that terrible budget, not once, but twice. That's why, Speaker. Ontarians are paying some of the highest hydro bills in, the, in this country. They cannot afford to pay more. Order. order. Minister of Finance, come to order. Please finish. They can't afford to pay more, Speaker. Even Bay Street fraudsters think that the Premier's numbers are fishy, Speaker. And once the Premier starts down this road, there is no going back. So before the Premier makes yet another wrong decision for the people of Ontario, will she give them a say through a referendum? Mr. Speaker, um, it is very important to recognize that, uh, as government, there are many things that have to be tackled at once. So the budget that the uh, leader of the third party is talking about did include uh, the review of, uh, of public assets. We said we were going to do that. And we said we were going to do that, Mr. Speaker, because we know that investing in transit and transportation infrastructure is what is needed right now. All 
across this country, Mr. Speaker, and in North America. There are jurisdictions that are looking for ways to build infrastructure. They know that if we are going to compete, we in North America, if we're going to compete with other jurisdictions around the world, we have to make those investments, Mr. Speaker. So that, is, that was part of our budget. But also part of our budget was increase in wages for PSWs, Mr. Speaker. Answer. It was increase in money for developmental services, Mr. Speaker. It was an increase in the minimum wage. The leader of the third party voted against Hamilton all of Mountain that Mountain as well, Mr. Speaker. Hydro One hurts middle class families and struggling Ontarians. It hurts moms and dads who need to pay the bills. It hurts young people looking for jobs, Speaker, because it's hurting businesses that want to hire those young people. It hurts health care. It hurts education. It hurts every corner of our province. This is the wrong decision. End of story. Will the Premier do the right thing? Will she finally do the right thing and give Ontarians a say on the sell-off of their Hydro One? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again, I would say to the leader of the third party, you can't on the one hand say that we talked about uh, uh, maximizing assets, selling off some of the assets that, uh, that are owned by the people of Ontario in Which order to be able to invest in new assets, Mr. Speaker, which is what she has said repeatedly, and then at the same time say that we didn't talk about this, and somehow it is a surprise to people that we said we were going to review assets in order to be able to invest in new assets. The fact is, we said we were going to do this, Mr. Speaker. This is not an easy decision. This is not an easy decision for the people sitting on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. But what is an important decision is that we make the right investments in 2015 so that in 20 2020 and 2025, we have the infrastructure that's needed so that businesses Answer. can move their goods, so that people can move, so that those families that the leader of the third party is talking about can get to their children's daycare and get to Thank their you. jobs in a decent amount of time, Mr. Speaker. Please. Please. Thank you. Final supplementary. The Premier can't pretend that she was up front with the people of Ontario during that election campaign. But New Democrats know the Premier's way, Speaker. We know the Liberal ways, and that's why we were so concerned. But there is still one fundamental question that Minister needs to be answered by this Premier. Why? Why will this Premier not bother to hear from the people of Ontario by putting the sale of Hydro One to a referendum. Why will she not do that, Speaker? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the reason... Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. The reason that we were so explicit in our budget and in our platform and then in our budget again, the reason we were explicit about how we were going to pay for transit and transportation infrastructure was that we knew, Mr. Speaker, that those were going to be difficult decisions. So we made it very clear that we were looking at OPG, we were looking at LCBO, we were looking at Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, we were looking at real estate that is owned by the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and that we needed to we needed to recycle, we needed to leverage those assets in order to make those investments. Mr. Speaker, we have made a set of very difficult decisions in order to make the investments that we know are necessary, because we know that if we don't upgrade our transit, Mr. Speaker, if we don't invest in Hamilton and in Kitchener-Waterloo and in Ottawa and in the Greater Toronto-Hamilton area, Mr. Answer. Speaker, if we don't do that, if we don't build the connecting links in our rural communities, if we don't repair those roads and bridges and build new ones, Mr. Speaker, we will not be able to compete. We must make those investments. Thank you. Your question, the member from the and Carleton. Speaker, my question is as well to the Premier. On February 2, 2013, her energy minister said to sell off Hydro One was, quote, a failed plan. In fact, not only did the Premier campaign against the sale of Hydro in every single election since she entered politics, her and Dalton McGuinty said it was bad for families, it would cause power rates to go up, and it was just, quote, plain wrong. 
The Premier has changed her policies and beliefs over the past year on anti-slap legislation, on government advertising laws, and on a publicly funded documentary starring herself. But the Hydro One about face is the biggest, most dishonest flip-flop we have seen to date. She now says the fire sale won't cost us more and dismisses any concern of, of a lack of oversight. I have a question. Was she lying then or is she lying now? The member will. I'll take care of the judgment here. The member will withdraw. One speaker. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I didn't hear. Withdrawn speaker. And if the member says it again, she will be named. Premier. Well, I guess it's the last week in the legislature, Mr. Speaker. I would just say to the, uh, to the member opposite that I've been very clear. Actually, from the time I started to run in, uh, in the, the leadership race, Mr. Speaker, I was very clear that investing in transit and transportation infrastructure was a priority. You know, I'd had the experience of being the Minister of Transportation. Finish, please. I actually had the experience of being the Minister of Transportation for two years, and I had traveled the province. There wasn't a jurisdiction. There was not a jurisdiction in the this province Ren that didn't. The member from Leeds, Grenville, and the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. Carry on. There wasn't a jurisdiction in this province that wasn't suffering from underinvestment of infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, the underinvestment that we inherited when we came into office in 2003. We've been working on that, Mr. Member Speaker, but we know that if we don't make Answer. those investments going forward, we won't be able to thrive economically, and so we're going to make those investments, Mr. Speaker. Her changing position on Hydro One sales not the only flip-flop with respect to this file. Take what she's going to do with the money and the profits. The Deputy Premier House said Leader. the profits of Hydro One would pay for infrastructure. Then she said it would go toward the debt when she was reminded and only reminded that it was the law. Now she's bargaining off Megalinson shares Lawrence. of the company before it's been sold to prevent a strike in the energy sector. She spent the profit three times already and the company hasn't yet been sold. This isn't a coherent plan for an asset sale in the province of Ontario, and it's not an appropriate way to manage the energy sector in this province. The two opposition leaders have asked you to withdraw Deputy this piece Minister of legislation Finance. from the budget. Will you do it, or is your pantsuit on fire over there? The member will withdraw. Withdrawn. Premier. Finance. Mr. Speaker, we've stated very clearly all along, consistently, since 2013, in our budget 2014, we did so twice. We put it in the platform of our election. The people spoke and reaffirmed their desire for us to move forward. We introduced it again in 2015 budget. It is a very pragmatic and deliberate way to maximize evaluations of a substantial crown corporation, while at the same time holding the majority shares of that corporation for the benefit of the public. It's going to be one of the largest growth companies. We're doing it in stages, Mr. Speaker. Only 50 per cent tranche in the first stage. It'll then determine its true maximized value, and we will do so to protect the public interest in the best interest of our public, and it'll be broadly held as a result, Mr. Speaker. And more so, Answer. the member opposite and that party were actually proposing a full 100 per cent um, sale of that corporation, which we are not doing. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Not a single Ontarian voted to sell Hydro One. Not a single Ontarian. And for months, for months, the Premier and her ministers insisted that was never the plan. They stood in the legislature and insisted that Hydro One was staying public. Now they've changed their tune. 
and the Premier is insisting a sell-off was the plan the whole time. Yeah. This is a mess, Speaker. While the Liberals are making a 180-degree turn, Ontarians are sending a clear message. Stop the sell-off. Will the Premier the from give Ontarians a chance to, order to have time. their Don't say from on Hydro Stony One to in a me. binding referendum? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Minister, speaker, let's, let's examine exactly what's happened since 2013. Pre-election 2013, we had a budget, Mr. Speaker, which indicated that we were going to assess all of our entrepreneur assets uh, for repurposing to invest in infrastructure. After the election, Mr. Speaker, we had a budget that was approved, Mr. Member Speaker, from James based Bay. on specifically reviewing, among other things, Member Mr. From Speaker, Timmons, James Bay, energy second time. agencies in terms of repurposing those assets, Mr. Speaker. Coming forward, Mr. Speaker, in, in, before the last election, in April 2013, Mr. Speaker, we appointed uh, Mr. Clark and the Asset Council to review. They studied that, Mr. Speaker, for almost a year. They then provided an interim report, yes, Mr. Speaker. They did further, further analysis. They provided a report, Mr. Speaker. Everybody in this province who was paying any Thank attention you. knew where we were going with this issue. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Uh -uh. Nice try. Actually, many of them read that interim report saying that it shouldn't be sold off. They knew where it should be going. Ontarians own Hydro One. It's clear they were kept in the dark. For months, the Liberal government insisted that Hydro One would stay public. Ontarians want a say. They want, don't want to pay the price for this wrong decision. Will the Premier give Ontarians a say on Hydro One by putting this to a full public referendum? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, there have been a lot of major, major decisions, major initiatives that have taken place uh, in this House, Mr. Speaker. Uh, some of the most important in the history of this province, Mr. Speaker. They did not go forward with a referendum, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have made this very, very part of our agenda since 2013. We're moving forward with an agenda that makes sense. Mr. Speaker, the idea of, of uh, uh, broadening the ownership of public agencies is not new. The NDP in Manitoba, Mr. Speaker, introduced a balanced budget bill. And they were proposing privatizing their agencies, Mr. Speaker. The two-way conversations have to stop. I need to focus. Just finish. Wrap up, please. I'll wrap up, Mr. Speaker, with that final comment that it's called the Balanced Budget Fiscal Management and Taxpayer Accountability Act, introduced by the NDP government in Manitoba. NDP. An NDP for sure, okay, Mr. Speaker, where they want to uh, consider the privatization time. of Manitoba Hydro, the Manitoba Public Insurance Corporation, Thank you. and others, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Newmarket Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. You may know, know that uh, June is Deaf Blind Awareness Month in Ontario and as of last week was declared by the Canadian Senate as Deaf Blind Awareness Month across Canada. June is the birth month of Helen Keller, who was a champion to people who are deaf blind. Her courage and determination is an enduring example of how, despite enormous challenges, individuals of all abilities can achieve great things. For someone who is deaf blind, communication barriers can seriously limit their access to activities most of us take for granted. Greater independence is achieved through better access to the community and its services. Minister, your ministry provides funding to the community agencies that support individuals who experience deaf blindness. Can you please give the House an overview of the community agency network which supports the deaf Question. blind community? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member for Newmarket Aurora for the question. My ministry's goal is to build greater independence for people living with disabilities, including those, of course, who are deafblind. And it is the work that our community agencies and professional interveners do for people who are deafblind that really assist in building a more inclusive Ontario. Intervenor services delivered by 21 community agencies across the province enhance communication between individuals and their 
their community through tactile sign language, Braille and American Sign Language, with the goal that they can live as independently as possible. I had the great privilege of visiting both the Canadian Helen Keller Centre as well as the Rotary Cheshire Apartments in Willowdale earlier this year. On my visits, I met several of the staff who every day bring the world to life for people who are deafblind. And I want to thank Answer. and celebrate those individuals for their skillful work and dedication. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Minister. Making Ontario a more inclusive province is a responsibility we all share, and there are many here, here. people to credit for the advances the deafblind community has achieved. As you said, Minister, it is those dedicated individuals in the intervener profession who work hard to open the doors of opportunity for people who are deafblind. Also, a lot of momentum has come from the work of the leading partners in the deafblind community who have raised awareness and worked closely with the government to build a better system. Good. This government believes that every Ontarian should have the opportunity to participate in the life of their community as much as they are able. Ontario is now a leading jurisdiction in the world for intervener services, and this government has tripled funding for that program since 2003. Wow. Minister, can you please detail some of the work your ministry Bruce has Gray been doing sound, to time. better support the deafblind Question. community? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, and I'm proud to say that Ontario has set an international standard for service delivery and is emerging as a world leader in policy development for programs and services for people who are deafblind. We are currently developing a new funding framework that will result in a consistent approach to funding that is fair, equitable and accountable. Our government has increased the minimum hours of service for all individuals who are deafblind, so those that require these services receive a minimum of 10 hours per week. Also, we fund an emergency intervener service that provides support to deafblind individuals should an emergency ever arise. Last year, we invested an additional $3.84 million over three years wow. in interpreter and intervener services to help support Answer. a stable and well-trained workforce. Together, we will build a stronger, more inclusive Ontario where people who are deafblind can participate to their Thank fullest you. potential. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Much like your scrap documentary, you're going to unprecedented lengths to keep the public in the dark about your Hydro One sale. Even before all our MPPs had a chance to speak to the budget, you closed off debate. Then you rammed it through committee, sitting only four days and only in Toronto. You turned down every one of our amendments that would have given businesses, families and seniors a fighting chance. Worse than that, you put forward a surprise amendment that immediately transfers Hydro One to a new corporation, one that you control. And now it's that corporation that will sell off its pieces to shareholders and remove scrutiny immediately. Premier, Question. what is it that you're so desperate to hide from us this time? Minister of Energy. Speaker, I wonder what it is that he's so desperate about that he won't look at the facts, Mr. Speaker. The facts are, Mr. Speaker, in 2000, when uh, Premier Harris uh, restructured the electricity system, all of the LDCs, all of the utilities, and Hydro One then and Hydro One today were set up with a whole co and an operating company. It already exists. It was a technical correction, Mr. Speaker, to describe what is now, Mr. Speaker. We have a hold co now, Mr. Speaker. We've had it for the last 15 years, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to have one moving forward. It was an amendment to correct the record, Mr. Speaker. I don't know. How he doesn't know that, Mr. Speaker. He should. Seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Sir. I guess we could have talked about it over a cup of coffee, Speaker. The, this amendment, Speaker, that they snuck in is the most serious piece of paper that this government has ever put forward. It transfers the largest asset owned Remember by the from people Beaches, East York. over to a corporation that you control, but you didn't do it here in the legislature. Last Thursday, it was snuck in as an amendment, a minor change to the budget. You just heard the, the minister call it that. So this minor change now 
immediately takes away the power of the Auditor General, Financial Accountability Officer, Freedom of Information uh, Ombudsman. They're cut out of the entire deal, Speaker, immediately. We have now no way to know which insiders they're paying to do what, or even if Ontario is going to be getting a good deal. Question. This is an affront to democracy. Premier, will you tell Ontarians what is so bad about the deal that you went to such drastic lengths to sneak this by us? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Yes. Minister Speaker, Finance. most, almost all public utilities, public companies for that matter, have holding corporations. And most corporations, be it those from Crown, similar to the federal government and other provinces that have tried and have maximized some of their holdings in the same format, have used Holcos. In fact, the Conservatives proposed the very same holding corporation when they were looking at this very venture. Oh. This, Mr. Speaker, will help maximize will help maximize the value of all of our shares, of which the province continues to hold 100 percent. More importantly, Mr. Speaker, it helps protect public ownership as we proceed forward so as not to dilute the uh, overall held of these shares through the holding corporation. The uh, member from Nipissing will come to order. New question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, we know that keeping class sizes manageable is fundamentally important to students' success. We also know that the Liberal government is aware of the fact that all research points to the importance of class size caps to ensuring the best learning environment for our students. Just a few years ago, the Liberals said, and I quote, we know smaller class sizes allow students to get more of the attention they need to learn to read, write, and do math at a high level." End quote. So what happened? Our schools are already in chaos because of more than a decade of chronic underfunding of education in Ontario, and bigger class sizes will only make the problems worse. My question is simple. Will the Premier make the chaos in schools even worse for our kids by allowing class sizes to increase this fall? Yes or no? Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And uh, as I've said repeatedly to the uh, member opposite, uh, in fact, the, the funding model this year provides $22.5 billion, just like the funding model last year provided $22.5 billion, despite the fact that there are actually fewer students uh, projected to be in the schools in September, which means we're actually spending more per student. Uh, if you were to look at the details of the funding model for next year, you would find that the class size generators in our grants are exactly the same next year as they are this year. So that uh, the, uh, I'm not sure why the member thinks that we are trying to change class sizes. That's not something Answer. that we are trying to do. The class size generators in the funding model are exactly the same now as they were last year. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, here we go again with the Minister of Education playing the blame game and refusing to take responsibility for the mass haircuts have made to education. We all know that class. Stop the party. Order. Please. We all know that class size caps are on the table. Speaker, I find the Liberals' change of heart on class size caps very perplexing. It is clear that the Minister of Education has lost control of the situation and is now trying to force students to pay the price for her ill-informed cuts. All evidence suggests lower class size caps are important to preserving quality education for our kids. The Premier and her government pay lip service to evidence-based policy, but when it comes down to it, it's obvious that they are not committed. The Premier and her government are clearly out of touch with what matters to most families. So I'll try asking the Premier again. Will the Premier maintain current caps on class sizes Question. to preserve the quality of children's education, or will she let class sizes increase Minister this fall and force students to pay the price? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to make it clear that we remained absolutely committed to negotiating collective agreements with all of our uh, partners, both the teachers unions and the education workers. We have three months 
between now and next September. I fully intend to be at the bargaining table over the next three months and to reach those collective agreements. But I must repeat, we have not cut education funding. In fact, if you look at education funding since 2003, the per pupil funding has actually increased by over $4,000. The per pupil funding Answer. has gone up by 59%. That's not blaming anybody. That's just simply providing accurate information, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Barrie. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. As the member for Barrie, I know how important transport and transportation is for those living in my community. Time and time again, I have constituents tell me that they that we need to continue to invest in critical infrastructure projects that will keep Ontario moving. They are frustrated by sitting in traffic. They are tired of gridlock. They are upset that they are spending time that could be spent with their loved ones parked on the four, Highway 400. And they want to know that our government is making investments that will keep them and their families moving efficiently, reliably across this province. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell members of this House how our government is planning to invest Question. in transit and transportation infrastructure across the province to keep Ontario families moving? Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member from Barrie for her advocacy on beha behalf of the people living in her community. Like many living in and working in the GTHA and, frankly, Speaker, in communities right across Ontario, I've felt the frustration of gridlock. Successfully fighting our congestion challenge requires strong leadership, the kind of leadership that Premier Wynne is showing, and an ongoing and consistent commitment to making the right decisions, even when those are not necessarily politically convenient. Families across this province are asking us to be bold, Speaker, to build to put shovels in the ground and to ensure that more transit and transportation options come into actual service, giving them and their families real choices. Last June, they gave us a mandate to put progress ahead of politics, Speaker, and to deliver results instead of more rhetoric. And that's exactly what we're doing, with critical investments being made in every corner of Ontario. And I'll provide an additional update in the supplementary answer. Thank you. <laughs> Question. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his response. I know that those living in my community will be excited to hear that we have such a strong vision for building transport, transit and transportation infrastructure across this province. And I'm pleased that the investments we are making will help those living in my community of Barrie. As an example, Regional Express Rail will provide better and more reliable service for those traveling along the Barrie Go Line. But I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, that members of the House will be interested in knowing exactly how we are delivering our vision. Can the minister please tell members of this House what investments our government has and will be making to deliver our transit and transportation vision for Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. We are delivering on our plan to move Ontario forward. Because of our $13.5 billion investment, weekly trips across the Go Rail network will increase from 1,500 trips to nearly 6,000 in 10 years. We were first at the table to support the construction of the Waterloo and Ottawa LRTs and will be there again to offer significant support for Phase 2 in both communities. We have built the Union Pearson Express, which comes into service this Saturday, Speaker, connecting Pearson Airport to Union Station. Here in the GTA, and the area around the GTA. We are and we will build LRTs in Hamilton, along Finch and Eglinton in Toronto, Mississauga and Brampton and Peel Region. Speaker, we'll continue to make critical investments through our $31.5 billion Moving Ontario Forward plan. Speaker, and if I can say, listening to the question posed this morning by members of that party, particularly the member from Nepean and Carleton, sir. I almost pity poor Patrick Brown, Speaker, because he has to lead that crew, and they've made it clear why they've lost four in a row. Thank you. Your question, the member from Lanark, 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 and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, you offered an outrageous lump sum payment. Member. Premier, you offered an outrageous lump sum payment in stocks in the soon to be privatized hydro utility to get the power workers union on board with your fire sale. 
This weekend, I came across a quote from June 2012, and I quote, We've been pretty clear. We'll keep Ontario Power Generation and Hydro One in the public hands as they should be. End quote. Premier, that was your Minister of Agriculture and his thoughts on the sell-off of Hydro One. Premier, will you be open and transparent and tell this House what you offered your minister to get him on board with your fire sale? Minister Finance. Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, this corporation will be one of the fastest growing corporations in Canada, one of the largest ones here in Ontario, based right here in Ontario. Mr. Please. Mr. Speaker, it will be broadly held. No one person can have more than 10 percent of this corporation, meaning that there will be more opportunities for retail and public investors to have ownership of the corporation, and we will do so in a very pragmatic and in a diligent manner to maximize the valuations for the entire public. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, we'll be able to uh, enable greater value of the corporation and reinvest some of the proceeds into another uh, very important Answer. public investment to generate even higher value for the entire public. Mr. Speaker, that's in keeping with the public good, and we'll continue Thank to you. do so. Well, clearly, the Premier doesn't take the uh, Agriculture and Rural Ontario, Minister, uh, Rural Ontario Minister very seriously. I'm not surprised that you've ignored your minister's objections. However, I would, like, I would think that you would take the concerns of the dean of the legislature and your chair of cabinet seriously when he expressed the following, and I quote, I think anyone who looks objectively at Hydro One, the transmission grid in this province, would recognize that it would naturally be something that is best kept in public ownership and public hands, end of quote. Premier, after 38 years in this legislature, I would think there was nothing left you could offer your chair of cabinet. Premier, what did it take to get him to contradict himself and throw away his liberal principles? You see that, please? You see that, please? Minister Farns. We're maintaining ownership of Hydro One. We're maximizing its value for the public good. We're reinvesting further into transmission as well as into other public infrastructure like public transit, which is important to the people of Ontario. More importantly, Finish, please. More importantly, this is not about selling an entire corporation. What we're doing is retaining at least 40% of that corporation, and at the start, we're maintaining 85% ownership in order to assess and maximize our value to the public. From Hamilton That's Mountains, exactly uh, in keeping what we said we should do, and it's in the public good. Uh, the member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. One wrap-up sentence available. The member opposite, for what he stands for? I'm shocked by his question in the first place. We are we are retaining ownership and we're doing so for the Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Union Pearson Express will begin exclusive diesel train service for business class travelers this Saturday. This is the only the only new rapid transit service the Liberals have delivered in Toronto since the flurry of transit promises that were made way back in 2007. Now, this government is keeping a promise it made to business class travelers, East York. but it's breaking the promise that it made to the communities throughout which this only uh, this dirty and— Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The Minister of Energy will withdraw. Gospel. Carry on. It's breaking the promise it made to the communities through which this dirty and noisy diesel train will run. Can the Premier tell us exactly when the last diesel train will run on the Union Pearson Express? Minister of Transportation. Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I'm always delighted to have the opportunity to stand in my place or be anywhere in the GTA. 
to talk about the extraordinary success that is and will be the Union Pearson Express. I mentioned it earlier, Speaker. It comes into service this Saturday. It's a train that will finally connect two of Canada's busiest transportation hubs, Union Station and Pearson Airport, with trains running 25 minutes long is the actual trip itself, Speaker, and we had the chance to try it out. Try it out. 19 and a half hours a day, these trains will be running, Speaker. It's being delivered on time, it's being delivered on budget, and most importantly, Speaker, it's being delivered on time for the Pan Am, Para Pan Am Games, which will be starting a little bit later on. Thanks very much. Speaker, in 2007, the government promised Torontonians that it would build two new subway extensions and eight new light rail lines. And then, before the last election campaign, the Premier declared the downtown relief line. Stop the clock. Member from Trinity Spadina is warned. Carry on. And before the last election campaign, the Premier declared the downtown relief line to be a top transit priority. But since 2007, they've cut $4 billion from transit funding, they've cancelled five of the light rail projects, deferred the Shepherd East LRT until at least the next decade, and there is no sign of the two subway lines, including the downtown relief line, that the Premier promised to prioritize just a year ago. So why should Torontonians believe that the government will not again delay and defer its promise to electrify Question. the Union Pearson Express. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. You know, Speaker, everywhere that we go in the GTHA and also in communities like Kitchener, Waterloo, and in Ottawa, people see very clear evidence of the extraordinary investments that we are making to build transit and transportation speaker. Here in the city of Toronto, if the leader of the NDP took the opportunity to travel around the city speaker, she would see that the Eglinton Crosstown LRT is under construction, the single largest public transit project in this province's history. She would see that the Toronto York Spadina subway extension is currently under construction, Speaker. The first time the subway will run into the 905. She would see again, Speaker, as I mentioned a second ago, that the Union Pearson Express will be operating this coming Saturday, Speaker. She would also note that over the last decade, we've invested $11 billion to build UpGo Transit. 23 million more Answer. people using Go Transit today than were 10 years ago, Speaker. And unfortunately, Speaker, unfortunately, what that leader doesn't say. Thank you. Reminding the minister, I stand, you sit. New question. The member from York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Speaker, the workers at Crown Metal Packaging have been on strike for 21 months. The employer has been using replacement workers at the site to keep up production and continue their very profitable business. Minister, you've made it clear that the ongoing uh, labour disruption at Crown Metal Holdings was disconcerting to you, and you said that the dispute does not follow the norm in terms of labour relations in our province. And it's not just concerning to the minister, Mr. Speaker, it is also concerning to the entire labour community. They've sent thousands of letters urging for greater action, and I'm sure that you would be aware uh, that labour leaders are here at Queen's Park this morning for a press conference on this very situation, pressing for action. Minister, you appointed an industrial inquiry commission sure. in April, but You've need no, uh, heard nothing since. Speaker, through you to the minister, when we, can we expect a resolution on this matter? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to the member. And thank you for asking another question on this. The member from York Southwest, and I think, is paying the attention that this issue deserves. The member's right. The ongoing dispute at Crown was concerning enough that we took action and we appointed the Industrial uh, in Inquiry Commission. And we're trying to get to the bottom of the remaining issues and advise on a path forward. This is unusual in Ontario, Speaker, but on this side of the House, we believe the best deals are negotiated right at the bargaining table. Sometimes that relationship breaks down, Speaker. Further action may be required from time to time. That's what's happened at Crown Metals. The process is unfolding with the assistance of Mr. Michnik. Pleased to report that since the appointment of the in inquiry, uh, the parties have resumed talking. Answer. Negotiations are continuing. 
But while they're at the table, Speaker, it's important we let the discussions happen and continue to hope Thank that you. an agreement will be reached. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The employees at Crown need answers, and they need them sooner rather than later. They've been out on the lines for 21 months. They're tired of walking the line, and no one seems to be listening. And we need to let them know that someone's listening. It's time that the workers know that our government has their back and that they won't let their struggle go unnoticed. Speaker, uh, Crown employees want the minister to know that the clock is ticking. They want to know that they will be able to return to their jobs. So, Speaker, the minister has said he has appointed Morton Michnik as the head of a an industrial inquiry commissioner, and the commissioner has had nearly two months to resolve the ongoing dispute. I, speaker, through you to the minister, what else can the government do? When do we expect to receive the advice of the industrial Thank you. inquiry commission? Mr. Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the member for York Southwestern for continuing to bring this issue forward on behalf of the working people in this province. The Ontario Labour Relations Act of 1995 grants a few special powers to the Minister of Labour to intervene during a labour dispute of this nature. Under Section 37 of that Act, I've already appointed an inquiry commission that's led by Morton Michnik. His job is to look into and report back on the dispute and with recommendations as to how we can move forward. He's a well-known, he's a respected mediator, he's a very good arbitrator. I've got full confidence in the ability of this individual to provide this House and to provide me with sound and reasonable advice on a path forward. It's essential to understand that Answer. the best deals are the ones that are made at the, that table. While the parties remain at the table, it's essential we let them continue. I can inform this House Speaker I anticipate Mr. Michnik's report will be here on June 17th of this year. Thank you. No question, the member from Simcoe North. Yes, Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Education. Yeah. Minister, you know now that because of virtually no bargaining taking place at either the central or the local level, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario has escalated their work to real campaign effective today. Minister, the clock is ticking. We both, we both know that a little over 800,000 elementary school students and their families are impacted by this escalation. And now, with just 99 days left before the students return from their summer recess, you have the potential of education turmoil on your hands. Minister, when will you actually get serious about the non-bargaining that's taking place and the turmoil that is building in the education system? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I, I want to emphasize that there are three months remaining uh, before the next school year starts. Uh, in fact, bargaining has been going on at various uh, tables. As I've uh, mentioned many times, we actually have nine central tables. And just because bargaining isn't happening at one on a particular week doesn't mean that bargaining isn't happening at another table in a particular week. So, in fact, central, central Central, uh, central bargaining is ongoing. We are, we are gradually working towards resolution on a number of issues, and uh, I am certainly committed to being at the table over the next three months, and I would uh, hope that uh, everyone would be there. The member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome Paul Rosebush, CEO of South Bruce Gray Health Centre. He's here to meet with Ministry of Health staff in regard to the Chesley Restorative Care Unit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member from Windsor to come see on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, with your indulgence, I have two uh, friends here this morning from the Windsor region representing the Windsor Construction Association. They arrived after the start of question period. Uh, President Steve Kutza Nicholas is here, and the Executive Director Jim Lyons. Welcome to Queen's Park, and Speaker, they invite you all to the reception at six in the dining lounge put on by the Construction Association of Ontario later today. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.